Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Is My Patient Ready for Hospice? My name is Lauren King, and I am the Community Education and Caregiver Academy Manager at Coastal Hospice. Among our attendees today, we are happy to see so many familiar organizations with us. We have people from Tidal Health, Atlantic General Hospital, Encompass Health, Chesapeake Healthcare, and many more. It's wonderful to see everyone today. Before we begin, allow me to go over a few housekeeping items. You may see myself or my colleagues, Alejandra and Joy, pop up in the chat box to help or adjust with any technical issues. I wanna thank you for your patience ahead of time, should we have any. I will also come back at the end to discuss the program evaluation. We will be using the chat feature to communicate with you throughout the webinar. You can access it by clicking on the messaging icon in your meeting controls. Our webinar today will be moderated by Lauren Blair, Community Relations and Development Manager and Caregiver Academy Moderator. Lauren has more than 15 years of experience in the healthcare field. Lauren holds a master's degree in social work from Salisbury University. She is a licensed master social worker in the state of Maryland and a licensed clinical social worker in the state of Delaware. Lauren serves on the board of directors at the Great Center of Maternal and Women's Health and subject matter expert for Dementia Care Resources Initiative through the National Partnership for Healthcare and Hospice Innovation. Lauren, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you for that introduction, Lauren. We're happy to see so many clinicians in attendance today. Thank you for being with us. It's my pleasure to welcome and introduce Dr. Joan Carpenter to you all today. Before I do that, I'm gonna share with you our disclosures. For physicians, for accreditation, we have this activity has been planned and implemented in accordance with the accreditation requirements and policies of the Accredited Council for Continuing Medical Education through the joint providership of Tidal Health Peninsula Regional and Coastal Hospice. Tidal Health Peninsula Regional is accredited by MedChi, the Maryland State Medical Society, to provide continuing medical education for physicians. The medical education team of Tidal Health Peninsula Regional designates this live activity for a maximum of physicians should claim only the credit commensurate with the extent of their participation in the activity. The planner, speakers, and education team of this educational activity declare that they have no relevant financial relationships to disclose with ineligible companies whose primary business is producing, marketing, selling, reselling, or distributing healthcare products used by or on patients. For nurses, Tidal Health is approved as a provider of nursing continuing professional development by the Maryland Nurses Association and accredited approver of the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. To successfully complete this activity and receive full contact hour credit, you must attend 100% of the activity, missing no more than 10 minutes, and complete and submit the evaluation. There are no relevant financial relationships. And for social workers, Tidal Health Peninsula Regional is authorized by the Board of Social Work Examiners in Maryland to sponsor social work continuing education learning activities and maintains full responsibility for this program. This training qualifies for Category 1 education credits. Again, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'd like to introduce you now to Dr. Joan Carpenter. She is an expert in geriatric palliative care, specializing in caring for older adults and their families. She's an assistant professor at the University of Maryland School of Nursing, a health scientist at the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, and a nurse practitioner with Coastal Hospice. Her practice and research focuses on palliative care interventions to improve the quality of life, reduce symptom burden, and enhance decision making for persons with serious illness and their care partners. Thank you for being here with us, Dr. Carpenter. On this Thanks, first Lauren. Slide, thank oh. you. <laughs> <laughs> On this first slide, we're going to look at, we're going to talk about the objectives. So one of the reasons that we wanted to address this topic that we've noticed is that many of our patients end up coming onto our services, you know, only one, two, three days before passing away. That doesn't really give us the opportunity um, to be with the patients for very long and their families and really to make sure that they can utilize all the services that we provide to them. So we invited Dr. Carpenter here today. She has had an amazing amount of experience, not only in identifying patients who are ready for hospice, but also with having those difficult conversations with patients and families. So Dr. Carpenter, what are we gonna be hearing about today? Yeah, thanks so much, Lauren. Um, this is such an important topic. And I see that we have 
51 participants and lots of folks are dropping in the chat uh, where they are attending from, what agencies they work for. Um, so we really appreciate seeing that because it helps us to um, <clears throat> talk to the different settings that you may be in um, providing healthcare to patients. So um, continue to do that, please, because I'm I'm checking out the chat and and looking to see who else there. Some some old some some old friends and some new friends for sure. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about recognizing the importance of establishing goals of care for people living with serious illness. Um, and and doing so, it's to understand you know what's really most important to them throughout their trajectory of serious illness. Um, we're also going to deliver some information to help everyone better understand hospice services, what hospice entails, and the type of care people receive when they are enrolled in hospice care. We're also going to talk a little bit about tools for prognostication and ways to determine hospice eligibility, um, and also discuss different strategies for talking with um, providers, where our peers, clinicians, and um, as well as our families and our patients about hospice care. So um, yeah, so next slide. Looking forward to hearing to hearing all about this, Dr. Carpenter. This is when a person faces a fatal disease that is likely incurable. He faces specific decisions, not only about medical treatment, but also about broader existential issues concerning the best way in which to spend his or her remaining time. Tell me, Dr. Carpenter, what thoughts does this elicit from you? Yeah, so when you think about someone who has been diagnosed with a terminal disease, we immediately think about the different treatments they they treatment options and choices they may be looking at and decisions that they need to make. But many times people are thinking about other things. You know, they're thinking about what's next. What does this mean for me? What happens to me? What happens to my family? You know, what happens to the people I care about in my life and the plans that I have going forward? That now everything has changed. Um, and so I think, you know, many times as healthcare providers, as clinicians, we are so focused on treatment decisions um, without having, you know, taking into to mind, taking into thought what other aspects of a person's life they may be thinking about when they're um, learning about a serious illness and trying to think through their next steps. So true. Absolutely. On our next slide, we're going to see some really interesting statistics. Dr. Carpenter, tell us what we're seeing here. Yeah, so we know, um, and, and this is not new information, right, that 80% that of Americans prefer to die at home, even more than that. You know, we know that Americans have long said that they prefer to die at home and not in an institutional setting. Despite this, you know, over time, we have seen these numbers improve from 60% of dying in acute care hospitals. You know, we've seen it as low at times drop to 30%, but still a, a lot of people are dying in acute care hospitals. Um, as well as nursing homes. And um, not as many are dying at home as say they wanna die at home. Um, some of the numbers do suggest 20 to 30% are dying at home, but that still doesn't equate to the amount of people, 80% saying they prefer to die at home. Um, we know also, and this is really concerning that um, you know, it's a small portion of dying patients that use hospice care um, and even those patients that are referred are referred really late in the disease trajectory. And we're talking in the last three to four weeks of life. I think the median stays about 18 days in hospice. Um, you know, and, and truly, you know, that is not always enough time to create a, an environment of, um, you know, where we're helping someone live with their serious illness with a good quality of life and good symptom management for the last six months of life, because that's what hospice care is intended to do. Um, we also know that um, 24 to about 40% of Americans can have put into writing how they want to be cared for at the end of life. Um, and, and that's really not enough. We want to see everybody putting some something in writing or something or appointing a decision maker, making sure that there is a conversation about the kind of care that they want at the end of life. So these are all really important um, topics to think about as we're going through the conversation today, what people want, the kind of care they want, and the actual kind of care that they're getting at the end of life. So important to share what it is that we want and, and to learn that from our patients. So we know because, you know, we see it every day, what a difference it can make for someone to, um, you know, to pass away with their family and their friends at home versus a hospital or another facility. But these statistics are still so high. 
why do you think that so many patients are still dying elsewhere rather than at home? Well, I, I think in general that, and these are, these are tough conversations to have. These are tough topics to talk about with patients. We know that um, it can be really challenging to have conversations about serious illness, about death and dying. And as clinicians, sometimes we feel that these are um, topics that we're not always comfortable with, yet it's so important to do so. Um, I think also, you know, media has, you know, shown us on TV and through movies how healthcare is delivered in this kind of romanticized way um, that is not the true way that, that healthcare is delivered in the United States and really in any anywhere that someone's receiving care in an acute care hospital, you know, all these famous shows that we have on TV. Um, so I think that there are misperceptions, there are myths, there are, you know, challenges in having these discussions that um, we need to overcome as healthcare providers and, and that we can um, with our patients and their families. So true. So many myths and misconceptions out there, and, and I'm glad that we're, there, we're talking today more about this. We're going to talk more on the next slide about quality of life. And I think that one issue that we don't talk enough about is, you know, what does the patient want to do? What do they want to do with the rest of their time, and how can we help them to achieve it? So it says, a good death is one that is free from avoidable distress and suffering for patients, families, and caregivers. In general, accord with the patient's and family's wishes and reasonably consistent with clinical, cultural, and ethical standards. Tell me more about this, Dr. Carpenter. Yeah, so you see some common themes here around, you know, what a good death is to a patient and what a good death is to a physician or a clinician. And that's that something, you know, an experience that is without pain, that is with comfort, um, and is peaceful. And so the idea is that we're able to relieve someone's symptom burden from serious illness to help them avoid distress, avoid suffering, um, and thinking also about the family and the caregivers who are caring for um, the patient and you know, making sure that they are receiving the care that they need as well as they go through the illness with the patient. Um, also, we want to make sure that we're providing care that is in congruent with what the patient and the family have expressed as their goals for treatment and treatment preferences, and that it's also in alignment with clinical, cultural, and ethical standards. And I think it's important to remember, um, you know, different cultures have different beliefs and have different preferences around end-of-life care and treatment decision-making. So it's really important to think about, the, you know, that part of, of this definition or of this um, statement um, thinking about what is appropriate and what is acceptable to different uh, cultures. One, you know, one of the biggest misconceptions that I get from the community is that hospice takes away medications. Can you tell us why that is and where that kind of stems from? Yeah, there's a lot, um, you know, in hospice and palliative care, there's a lot of talk about, you know, what we're not going to do, right? Okay, we're not going to use these medications, we're not going to use these certain treatments. Um, and that's many times because those treatments are, uh, those medications are actually more burdensome than beneficial to people who are at the end of life or within the last six months of life or the last year of life. So many times the hospice team may be the first clinicians that are interacting with a patient who are looking at them as a whole person and not just as a disease. So, you know, many times our very sick patients have multiple specialists who see them and manage one chronic disease or one um, of their many diseases and maybe don't look at the whole picture. When someone um, is admitted to hospice care, the clinicians, the nurses, the um, providers look at all the medications that a patient is taking and really holistically say, you know, which, which medications are um, beneficial at this point and which, may, which ones may be burdensome. Good examples of this are medications that are designed to, um, uh, to help the progression of dementia. We know people with advanced dementia don't benefit from those medications and many times they can cause side effects such as anorexia. <clears throat> also medications designed to um, you know, anti-cholesterol, you know, hypercholesterolemia medications, you know, medications that are designed to be preventative in nature may not really be essential at, at this point. And that's a really important consideration um, to, to take into account whenever um, someone is going into hospice care that the, the intent is not to take 
um, medications and treatments away, but to use medications and treatments that are most appropriate for that stage of the disease. That's a really important point that you're making is the you know side effects sometimes that they're maybe making people a little bit worse, whereas we could take away things, they may perk up a little bit even. Absolutely right. If we're able to reduce medications, many times we do see patients perk up and, and pill burden is a real thing. You know, polypharmacy is a real thing. You know, people don't want to take, I mean, I can't tell you how many older adults I work with who tell me they take too many pills and can we help reduce the um, amount of medications that they're taking? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to talk about various disease trajectories on the next slide. And please, everyone, feel free to put any questions or comments in the chat box. I'll be monitoring them uh, as we go along. Dr. Carpenter, explain to us what we're seeing here on the screen. Yeah, so um, you know, these are different disease trajectories, which have been around for a long time. Um, and really, I don't think we've seen a whole lot of change. Um, I think we see a lot more people living with frailty and organ failure um, these days than we used to. Um, but the first, the first trajectory in the upper left-hand corner is sudden death, and this is this is one in which there's very little we can do. These are, you know, um, tragic accidents. These are, um, you know, sudden um, cardiac arrests, and and these are, you know, situations where there's very little we're able to do for the patient. But remember, hospice care does provide bereavement support for families, and you don't have to have been on hospice care for a patient or for a family to receive the benefits of bereavement care from a hospice agency. Um, the next trajectory to the um, top right, terminal illness, we often see this in cancer, right? So people who are, you know, living with terminal illness that is, is relative, is treated at a re in relatively stable for some period of time. And then um, as the disease progresses, there's a somewhat rapid progression um, to end of life. Um, the bottom two trajectories, as I mentioned, are more common now than we've ever seen because of the really true advancements we have in medical technologies and medications. So we're, people, we're seeing people live longer with chronic um, illnesses, with comorbidities, with organ failure. So in the bottom left trajectory with organ failure, we see that you know people are in this in this trajectory are, are doing okay. They're they're functioning. They're able to take care of themselves. And then they may have an exacerbation, maybe um, with COPD, they have a respiratory, um, acute respiratory failure and may be hospitalized, um, have an exacerbation during that time. And then after hospitalization, they are able to recover to somewhat of their previous level of function, but then it's not long again before we see another exacerbation. This next exacerbation may require intubation and um, use of a, a ventilator. Um, so then you know, they recover maybe from this and, and but are not as functioning as high as they were the previous time they had an exacerbation. And this goes on for a long period of time. This could go on for years. And so um, as time goes on with each of these dips you see in this trajectory, you see that overall the illness is worsening, but they're able to come back a little bit to um, a previous, somewhat close to a previous level of function, but not the same. Um, and, and with these folks, oftentimes you can say to them, you know, how is this hospitalization different than the one six months ago or the one that you had a year ago? And oftentimes they can say, oh, well, I, I was able to go right back home after that hospitalization. But this time I need to go to a nursing facility to get rehabilitative care because I'm not as strong as I was. Um, and then in frailty, the bottom right uh, trajectory um, you know, this is often seen in um, neurodegenerative diseases such as dementia, Parkinson's disease, ALS, MSA, um, MS. You know, we see a, a progression of the disease over time. Um, often these, uh, you know, patients plateau for some period of time and then may have a decline in function. Um, oftentimes, you know, with dementia, we see people who are, you know, at a certain level of function, they're maybe still able to walk and feed themselves, but may suffer a fall or have an infection that requires hospitalization and they're not able to get back to that previous level of function. Maybe after that hospitalization, they're not able to walk. Maybe they're just transferring themselves from the bed to the bedside commode, and maybe they're not able to get back to that previous level of function. So that's what I you know, think about when I see the, the more frailty type of trajectory. I think this is such a great illustration of why advanced directives and advanced care planning um, or just making someone aware of your wishes 
uh, is so important as we see, you know, the different things that um, the different trajectories that things can go in. And so um, we're going to take even a deeper look into this on the next slide coming up. I know there's a lot of information on this slide. Can you help us understand how hospice and palliative care can play a role in these different trajectories? Sure. And, and so, as you said, this is a busy slide, but it's it's super helpful to layer each of these trajectories on each other so you can think about, hmm, when is the best time to introduce palliative care? And if you ask me, palliative care is for any stage and any age of serious illness. Um, so you see here we have palliative care and then we also have, you know, where we may introduce hospice care. So in trajectory one, um, this is, you know, the what we call the cancer trajectory on the previous slide, where there's, you know, someone who's living with, a, you know, serious illness is able to, you know, live with good quality of life, likely with good symptom management um, with the treatments that they're receiving. But over time, you may find that the treatments aren't working as well as they used to, right? And um, maybe they're starting to suffer so with some symptoms, um, either as a side effect of the treatments or as, as, as a result of the progression of, of the disease. It's a really good time to introduce palliative care whenever you start to see um, the burdens outweighing the benefit of treatment or that symptoms are, are worsening. In trajectory two, um, this is what we talked about with organ failure, and you see the, the times where a person may have an exacerbation of, of their um, illness, of their serious illness, um, that requires them to, um, not, to have maybe more um, help after an exacerbation. Like I mentioned, you know, someone who maybe previously went home after hospitalization now maybe need to go to a skilled nursing facility. And sometimes <clears throat> these folks may not go home from a skilled nursing facility. That might be where they stay for long-term care. You know, really good idea as you start to see these these declines to introduce palliative care um, after uh, you know many times after an exacerbation is a good time to ask a patient you know how do you how do you how are you feeling about things what are you thinking about your illness and we'll talk a little bit about those skills and having discussions about serious illness um, in the in the coming slides but these are you know good times to introduce a discussion about goals of care and treatment preferences and palliative care. Trajectory three, again, the frailty trajectory, as we talked about dementia, neurodegenerative diseases, you see kind of a gradual decline over time that oftentimes to a caregiver may not be as apparent as it is um, to others. You know, so oftentimes I do ask um, caregivers, you know, how has how has dad changed over the past six months? You know, what have you seen change? Oh, dad, you, dad was feeding himself six months ago, but now he needs a lot of assistance. Um, with eating, you know, he he doesn't finish his plate, you know, we need to sit with him. Um, those are all times where it's really important to introduce the idea of palliative care, the idea of having goals of care conversations, you know, and earlier in the disease, the better, truly, because that's when someone can help to decide what they want for themselves going forward um, before that they're maybe, they may be unable to give um, input into their goals of care and treatment preferences. I, the other thing that we should mention is the red line here, where you know a person has um, progressive chronic disease management, and as time goes on, you're seeing the despite giving chronic disease management, despite um, providing different treatments, the disease seems to be worsening, and that's a really important time to be thinking about. Okay, we're providing these treatments, but yet the disease is worsening. Where, where are we going here and, and what should we be thinking about going forward in treating this person um, and their illness? This was super helpful, super helpful to kind of unpack unpack this slide, I think. Um, I know I'm interested in hearing more. You said that we were going to talk more about having starting those different com difficult conversations. So I think in the next slide, um, you know, let's talk about just where we begin. Where do we start? Yeah, and it's it's really this is all about the patient and, and their family and and what do they want, um, you know it's it's also really important to 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 make sure that a patient and their family and their decision makers understand what what is happening um, when they're diagnosed with a serious illness and what's going on and um, we know that people only absorb about two to three pieces of information when they're given serious illness news, so. It's, it's super important to you know, find out what they understand, what they heard, and then what it is that, that they would want for themselves going forward. But that's always the most important um, tenet to think about is, is what, would they, what do they want for themselves? 
starting where they know, figuring out what they want. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to discuss why established goals of care. Dr. Carpenter, why is this so important? So we talked a little bit about um, in the beginning about the around the objectives, about why you know it's it's really important to understand you know what a person may want for themselves. And goals of care are really a roadmap for future care. It gives a um, clinicians, providers, family members who are helping make decisions an idea of what a person wants for themselves, and it helps to clarify any uh, misconceptions, any misunderstandings, so that whenever a person's making a decision, um, that, that they're clear about what they're making a decision about. We also want to make sure that patients and their families, not strangers, are making their own decisions. You know, um, it's not uncommon for us sometimes to have to contact a family member across the country um, for someone who's unable to make their own decisions to get them involved in care because they're the next um, available responsible party for the patient. Um, and that, that's, a, that's someone who may not have been involved with the patient in their life for the past couple of years. So by establishing goals of care with our patients, when we are working with them on a day-to-day, month-to-month, year-to-year basis, we know what's most important to them. Um, and then that helps us to align the treatments that we suggest, the treatments that are offered to them with their goals. So we're not um, suggesting treatments that we know they may not want. For example, if someone says, I do not want to receive aggressive life-sustaining treatments, I would not want to be placed on um, a, a ventilator for life-sustaining treatment that it was, you know, if I was unable to be weaned off the ventilator or I would not want to be um, receive, you know, medically administered nutrition through a feeding tube, we want to make sure that that's clear um, and we understand that. And so that helps with making future care decisions. Absolutely. Do you find that it most of the time does take more than one conversation with the patient or family before they can really kind of make these decisions? It does. It does. And that's, that can be really hard for clinicians because we're all pushed for time. We all want to, you know, kind of get the, make sure that we get the visit complete um, and, and have the encounter, you know, um, complete so we can move on to the next, the next patient. And these conversations take so much time and, and you may only cover a couple topics in a conversation that takes 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. So Knowing that um, these these conversations should be revisited, that you know you may only get through you know, your first conversation may just be finding out what a person understands about their illness, and that may be the furthest that you get, and that may be the furthest that a patient's ready to talk about, and it may be during the next conversation that you can advance a little further and say, okay, let me clarify some of your some of these you know. Um, things that you may not understand about your illness and about the treatments and what life would look like with these treatments. Um, you know, many times people don't know that, um, you know, for example, you know, going through surgery, an older adult going through surgery is often going to be in the ICU, you know, a major surgery in the hospital, maybe in the ICU after surgery. And it may be really difficult um, during that stay to wean them off the ventilator. And so people don't always have that clear understanding of what life looks like after receiving a treatment, um, a procedure, et cetera. Can you give me an example of a time that you felt establishing, establishing um, goals of care was exceptionally helpful with the patient? So I, you know, I gosh, there are so many different times. Um, you know, I do think about a time where we had a, um, a daughter and her father, the father was diagnosed with an aggressive cancer that, well, he had been receiving several treatments, was on like a third line treatment and had not really had conversations about what was most important to him going forward. And the daughter was um, really not asking questions and really not questioning her, her dad about his illness. And so he, really, truly, she didn't know what he wanted for his future. He was doing what he thought um, he wanted, not realizing that um, he didn't, he had choices that he could make. He didn't have to continue with these certain treatments that weren't making him feel very good, um, that were somewhat burdensome to him. And once we were able to sit down and he was able to tell us these things, you know, that he'd been thinking about and the daughter understood it clearly, um, we were able to create a, a plan of care for him that focused on keeping him home as long as possible. Um, 
treating his symptoms and making sure his daughter was equipped with the information going forward that she could make decisions if he was unable to do so that it would help him remain at home and not be hospitalized at the end of life. That's so important. So important. We're going to talk in the next slide about how to begin the conversations uh, with our patients and the families. Dr. Carpenter, like you said earlier, we know, you know, it takes more time than just once or twice, maybe for our patients to really come to terms with their prognosis. So, so how do we begin? So, and this is where I think um, all of these different clinicians, I was just looking at the webinar chat, all of the different clinicians that are on this call from all of the different um, agencies that you represent, the, um, you know, healthcare clinics, the hospitals, the um, community settings where you have relationships with patients. It's so important to develop that, that trust, um, to be able to have conversations with a patient and their family where they, they trust the um, opinions that you're giving them. They trust the advice that you're giving them. They trust you know, what you're giving them um, in education and, and helping them understand. So truly, this is, this is really important. And this can be really difficult to do during just one conversation when you meet someone for the first time. Um, so developing that relationship of trust, um, recognizing that, that people do want to hear the truth. Um, this can be really hard as clinicians because we deliver serious illness news. We talk about topics like death and dying, which can be scary, yet it's something that every single one of us is going to have to you know, encounter at some point, but yet we tend to shy away from it. So you know, recognizing that, that telling the truth is, is important. Um, that doesn't mean that, that information is given in an, an unempathetic way. Um, many times I ask people how much they want to know about their illness. You know, okay, you know, tell me what you, tell me, what you know and tell me how much you want to know. Um, so I let, I let patients and their families guide that conversation a little bit um, based on when they're ready to hear the information. But I don't um, not give them the truth. I also, um, this is so important, asking questions that, that help build your understanding of what a patient's values and preferences are. You know, open-ended questions are so important. That it's, it, 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 it is just critical to be able to ask people, how much do you understand about your illness? What do you know? What have you been told? How, have, how, has, your, how has your doctor told you that the cancer is doing? And, and asking them questions in a way that they understand them. Not, not necessarily saying, okay, you know what, so what, um, you, you know, what, you know, not looking for the medical jargon or not giving them medical jargon that they're not going to be able to answer your questions, such as, you know, what stage is the cancer? Some people may know, some people may not know. You really have to start, especially, um, lots of times with older adults who may not have been given the information, who may not have heard the information, who may not have understood the information. You know, it's really important to, um, you know, ask these open-ended questions in a way people can understand them. And then also asking them about you know, what's important to them, knowing what they know, what's important to you. You know, how do you want to spend your time knowing what you know? Um, yeah, so I think, you know, these are really kind of the major parts around beginning a conversation. It's really simple in, in one way, but at the same time, that can be hard for for us as clinicians, because we care, we care about our patients. And so it's hard to, to really kind of be able to explain to them what's happening. But I, I feel like it's really a gift to be able to ask them, you know, how do you want to spend your time? What do you know about what's happening to you? That way they know, and they have all that information. And it's really, um, you know, helping them fulfill their wishes. And it's really a gift. I think, yeah, I think there's nothing more rewarding as a, as a healthcare provider to be able to honor a person's treatment preferences and be able to provide the kind of care that they want at the end of life. It may not be the same thing we would want, right? Um, and, and sometimes there are people, there are certainly people, um, patients and families who make decisions um, around using more aggressive treatments at the end of life. Um, I always think about honoring their preferences and making sure they understand the, the decisions that they're making and, and what those treatments will look like for them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And a question come in the chat box from Veronica says, how do you deal with the resistance to the H word? I see sometimes how doctors and patients don't like to say hospice. That's a great question. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's scary or it's, um, 
you know, it's like, oh, well, if, if, if we say hospice, that means we're giving up on somebody or that we don't think there's anything else we can do. And there's so much we can do. And I often, you know, tell people, um, the first thing I say when someone is resistant to hospice, I, I say, tell me what, tell me what you know about hospice. What, what have you, what, what's been your experience with hospice? And this can be, uh, you know, as, as you know, the resistance that it's patients, it's clinicians, it could be, it could be a lot of different people who have this resistance. Um, and I often, I, again, it's, it's these communication skills. I just want to find out what's going on. Like what, what's been your experience? Sometimes, you know, I've had clinicians or I've had patients say to me, well, um, when, you know, I've had a patient say, well, when uh, my uncle was admitted to hospice, he died three days later on morphine or, and it's, it's, it's not, and saying, oh, well, tell me more about his illness. What was happening when he was admitted to hospice? Oh, he went to the hospital. He was there for three months. He was really, really sick. Well, there's a lot more context there to maybe what's informing that person's understanding of hospice care. You know, I've also um, had people say, well, I, I don't, um, I don't want to go anywhere. Well, hospice, you know, because people assume hospice is a place. Yes, we have a hospice residence, we have a hospice inpatient unit, but by far the majority of patients receive hospice care in their home environment, whether that's a personal home, this is the living facility, nursing home, group home. So, you know, this resistance sometimes can be overcome if you find out what it is that the resistance, where the resistance is coming from. Um, and, and certainly we have families that, you know, we have had the experience where families don't necessarily want to use the word hospice around their, their ill family member, or the family member with, with um, terminal illness. And so, you know, kind of gently, empathetically moving through that conversation and asking questions, um, being really in, in, um, interested in the answers and thinking about ways to help them maybe better understand hospice services um, is one approach. That's great. That's great. And we'll get more into um, some specifics of our services a little bit later on. So now we come to our slide on truth telling. Dr. Carpenter, what do you feel might be helpful for physicians who are kind of tiptoeing around the truth? Well, and it's yeah, it's like we it's just like we talked about before is that people they want to know the truth about the diagnosis and the prognosis. And oftentimes family members don't want their loved one maybe to know their diagnosis. Um, and, and sometimes that can be culturally appropriate. So I want to make sure that I'm, you know, you know, this could be there can be situations, obviously, where this may be culturally appropriate, and that's important. Um, thing to think about. Um, healthcare providers sometimes worry that they may cause depression or cause a patient to lose hope in truth telling. You know, I think this goes back to um, having a conversation that is empathetic, using um, communication techniques where you are asking a patient, a family, you know, how much do you want to know? How much, you know, and not giving them maybe all the information about the illness at the same time, that can sometimes be scary to people, but giving them, you know, two to three pieces of information at a time, and then having them tell you what they understand about what you've told them. What do you understand about what I've just shared with you? Can we continue this conversation? Can we continue talking? So I think sometimes um, there have been situations where, you know, people, they are, they are scared for sure, but they can be supported in learning the information about their illness and, and learning the truth um, and understanding what's what's going on um, with their bodies. It was interesting. I had a patient in the nursing facility who came in and um, I asked her what she knew about her illness. And she said, I don't know anything. And I said, well, how much do you want to know? And she said, I want to know everything because I know I'm sick. I know I'm not well, but I don't know what happened in the hospital. I don't know all the things that were done, you know, the treatments that were given. And I want to know, and once we were able to talk through all of the different, um, you know, uh, treatments and procedures and medication changes that happened during a seven day hospitalization that resulted in the skilled nursing facility admission um, and with the daughter present, the patient said to me, I, I just wanna be at home. And if, you know, I understand that I'm, I'm sick and I know we're not going to cure these, these illnesses, I wanna go home. And we were able to um, discharge that patient home with hospice care. And again, like I said, there's nothing really truly more um, rewarding in this job than being able to provide the care that a patient wants when they're living with serious illness. Absolutely. This reminds me of a story that you told me before about the husband and wife who were kind of tiptoeing around each other, around these truths. You mind sharing that with, with our audience? 
Oh, sure. So yeah, it's a, you know, again, another situation where a patient was diagnosed with a serious cancer, it was progressing treatments were he was no longer responding to treatments. Um, a couple had been married 60 years and he didn't want to talk to his wife because he didn't want her to, he didn't want to hurt her. He didn't, you know, want to talk about all these really difficult topics. Um, and talking to the wife separately, she didn't, um, she didn't want to talk to him because she didn't want, she knew it was going to be hard and she felt like she didn't want to, you know, hurt him. And so we were able to say, okay, how, how can maybe can the three of us come together? Can I help separately to each of them? Can I help each of you talk to each other? Can we, can the three of us talk together and talk in a way that's, um, you know, open, um, yet, as I mentioned, empathetic, um, you know, sensing the tenderness of the topic and, you know, moving through it in a, in a gradual manner and making sure that they were comfortable as we, as we talked through the information. Um, and, you know, it was, I think so much, of, somewhat of a relief, um, for them to have that, that assistance during the conversation. And this is another patient who ended up being discharged home from the hospital with hospice care. So, once they were able to come together and have the discussion and, and talk openly. Amazing how that can work out to make sure that, you know, they're getting what they both, what they both desire and what, um, what the patient most especially desires. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. We want to give our attendees here today, some tools for their toolbox of actual language to use uh, with their patients. So on this slide, um, I'm going to turn to you, Dr. Carpenter, to share with us where to start. Sure. And these are what you'll notice about these questions. These are not yes and no answers. These are open um, ended questions. What has the doctor told you about your illness? Super simple question to ask. Tell me what's been happening over the past few months. Tell me your story. Tell me what's been going on. Really casual. And I'm not, you notice that these are, there's no medical jargon in these, in these questions. It's what's been happening over the past few months. And then you can slowly narrow into you know, the, what, what you may want to hear more about as a clinician, which is how have you been able to care for yourself? How have the symptoms been bothering you? What has been going on with um, your functional status? You know, have you been hospitalized multiple times? How has that been? Um, also, what's most important to you right now? Knowing what you know about your illness, what's most important to you? Another um, question, and this is more for surrogates to think about people who are making decisions, you know, for a person who's unable to make their own decision, you know, if your loved one, if your family member, if your friend, if they, if they could tell us what they wanted right now, what would they want us to know? If, if, if they had the same understanding that you have about their illness, what would they want us to know? Um, so again, really simple, basic questions that, that can be very helpful and, and helping us understand um, what's most important to a person, what they understand, and how we can guide them through having a discussion about their goals of care and treatment preferences. What are the fears that patients tend to have when they're told that they have a terminal illness? You know, it's 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 probably that fear of the unknown. I mean, you know, and really that's just, you, you think about it, you you don't know what's going to happen going forward. And you have all, I mean, think about all the hopes and dreams people have in their lives and all the different plans they may have for the future. And being told that you have a serious illness or a terminal illness or you know any type of disease that's going to limit what you're able to do, it's a it's a very you know uneasy feeling. And um, you know, the fear of the unknown, I think, is is one of the, the biggest ones. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're coming to our next slide. Talk less, listen more. There are so many unknowns and uncertainties, like you're saying. Um, that's why it's so important for clinicians to take their time with the patients to have these conversations. Dr. Carpenter, what strategies do you use with your patients? Well, again, you know, again, you're know, talking less, listening more. We talk a lot as clinicians and really we need to be doing more listening to our patients and their families. Um, one thing I always ask is, you know, have you ever, when, once we get to the point where we were actually discussing care preferences, have you, have you written this down? Have you talked with, with anyone about this? Has this been written down in any sort of uh, advanced directive document or other type of, of document um, that is, that is useful for future information around someone's illness? Have you spoken to your family about your wishes? You know, again, have you talked to anybody about this? Have you appointed someone to speak for you if there comes a time where you're not able to to tell us your wishes. So I think these are the most important things. Have you written it down? Have you talked to your family about it? Or have you appointed somebody to speak for you who knows these wishes? Important. 
We're going to talk next about when hospice is appropriate. The average time of a caregiver that a caregiver spends caregiving is four years. That's a lot of care and support, a lot of time to, you know, to give of your own. Um, and there's so mm -hmm. much that hospice can provide. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it is a lot. I mean, for um, four years plus being a caregiver and being a caregiver is, is, is really tough work. Um, so when hospice is appropriate, thinking about when a person has a terminal illness that has a prognosis of six months, uh, six months or less, should the um, disease run its usual course, um, progress along its usual course, um, that the goals of care for the patient and family are comfort, um, and they're no longer seeking curative interventions with palliative care. Many times people are receiving curative interventions at the same time as receiving palliative care. Um, from an interdisciplinary team or from a provider. So, you know, thinking about when maybe someone is no longer looking for curative treatments. Also, when the burdens of a treatment become greater than the benefit of a treatment. Um, when it, when really the, the treatments are causing more symptom burden, they're causing, um, you know, patient being unable to care for themselves, being able to do less for themselves. You know, those are when burdens would be greater than, than the potential benefits. In our next slide, we're going to talk about the focus of hospice. We have this diagram to explain. Dr. Carpenter, you want to help us interpret this? <clears throat> sure. So when you think about the focus of hospice care, it's obviously focused on the patient and family. You know, this is wraparound support for everyone involved in a, a patient's serious illness, providing interdisciplinary care through social worker, nurses, um, providers, physicians, uh, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, um, spiritual care and uh, pastoral care folks, um, nursing assistants and volunteers. Um, focus on the last stages of an illness, the dying process and the bereavement period, which we'll talk about in a little bit that you know, hospice provides that care for um, those family and friends who, are, who have cared for a patient um, after, when they've died. And then um, with all with the focus on comfort and support. Absolutely. Absolutely. And on the next slide, we'll go into a little bit further about the highlights just that we provide. Um, I'm going to go through those quickly as I know we're getting limited on, we're a little bit limited on time, but this has been, this has been great and so helpful. Um, pain and symptom management, of course, is just a huge, huge support when we're talking about what hospice um, and palliative care can provide. Uh, we train our patients, families to use the durable medical equipment that is supplied, like lawyer lifts, even a trapeze. Uh, we train families and um, and family caregivers uh, how to um, transfer patients, how to turn them, how to help them bathe, how to feed them even. We have OT, PT, and speech therapy when needed uh, to really maximize the time that the patients have left. Uh, we do short-term inpatient care. If there's a crisis, patients can have their symptom managed um, at Coastal Hospice at the Lake and now um, the Stansell House as well in Ocean Pines. Also, we know how exhausting it can be, you know, to care for a loved one at home. Four years is, is a long time and, you know, it can be, it can be even more than that, as we know. So hospice provides inpatient respite care. That way, if a caregiver needs a break or is going out of town or has their own health care issues, whatever the case may be, uh, the patient can be in a safe environment uh, free of charge. And we do that both at Coastal Hospice at the Lake and the Mackey and Pam Stansel House now as well. Uh, something many, I don't think, know about um, hospice is, and bereavement care especially, uh, we provide a bereavement care to patients' families for at least 13 months after a patient passes away. And we do that because then they're getting some support for every first, you know, every first holiday that passes after um, someone passes away, every first anniversary of their passing, you know, we're there, we're there to be able to support them. We also care for pediatric patients and they can receive concurrent care. So they can receive hospice services at the same time that they're receiving treatment for illness. I want to point out too, that we do free informational sessions to patients and families. Our access team who does our admissions, they will actually send a nurse to your patient's home to provide them with more information on hospice and what services we provide. So please utilize us for those conversations. You don't have to do those conversations alone. We're here to help as well. Um, and we can certainly, you know, it's a, sometimes it can be even different when we're able to go out to their homes and have that conversation in a more intimate setting. Um, there's just so many services that we can offer to patients and families and really to be able to, um, you know, to provide the, the best quality of care. And I see a, a comment from Lori in the chat box as a nurse and daughter whose mother passed this past fall with hospice involved in her last days. 
I know that I really appreciated the bereavement resources my siblings did also. Thank you, Lori, for sharing. Um, thank you so much. We're, we're very proud of what our bereavement services are able to provide. So I want to talk about who pays for hospice too. This is a big question I get. Um, and I will explain a little bit. I think that it's important to highlight that hospice is a free benefit. We pay into, we pay into hospice. We all do. Our patients do not receive bills for hospice care. I want to point out too that our physicians, um, that physicians in the community can continue to care for their patients and see them, and they continue to get paid under the Medicare, um, under Medicare. So Medicare allows for both physicians to, to bill for services. Um, you know, we know that, you know, physicians in the community, you have the rapport with patients, you know them and they trust you. So we encourage providers out there to keep your patients, um, keep seeing them and, um, and bill under hospice services. And if you aren't familiar with the way to bill, please feel free to call us at Coastal Hospice and we will be happy to assist. Let's talk about eligibility in the next slide. The goal of our webinar today, is my patient ready for hospice? Dr. Carpenter, what determines hospice eligibility? Right, and we talk, talked a little bit about this before, that the patient has a terminal illness with a prognosis of six months or less um, when the disease, was, the disease um, progresses along its natural course, and that the goals of care are focused on comfort and quality of life. Um, many times, though, remember, most people are focused on being comfortable and having a good quality of life throughout their serious illness. So it's really helping to them to determine, you know, when they may no longer be seeking curative treatments um, for their illness. I think it's important to talk about um, the core indicators of what may bring maybe someone eligible for hospice services. So we'll talk about those in our next slide. Will you share a little bit of this with with us, Dr. Carpenter? Sure. And this is a great um, handout that hospice provides about um, the coastal hospice that we have, the quick guide. These core indicators, and you see these nine disease categories listed on the left side of the slide. You know, these are our major um, diseases, right? Heart disease, pulmonary disease, renal disease, dementia, ALS, neuro neurodegenerative disease, HIV, AIDS, cancer, liver disease, CVA, coma. And then you have indicators of decline. And many of us are familiar with these indicators, right? People who have recurrent infections, weight loss that um, continues despite, you know, different types of interventions, such as, through, you know, some more smaller meals during the day, or maybe an appetite stimulant, um, decreasing lab values, such as a serum albumin um, or anemia, dysphagia, you know, shortness of breath, what? progressive pressure ulcers or wounds, what? um, decline in functional status. So this is a handout, um, a guide, quick guide that hospice can provide you with. Absolutely. And I want to know if you don't already have a copy of this packet size guide, please let us know. We'll be happy to get you one. They're, they're so great to have on hand. They slip right in your, in your pocket. We have some tools for prognostication on this slide. Tell us about these, Dr. Carpenter. Yeah, so we talked just on um, the last slide around, the, around about the core indicators. We also have the palliative performance scale. This is a, a scale that we use in palliative and hospice care, um, really looking at the level of ambulation, activities, self-care intake, level of consciousness to help us decide, you know, how someone is progressing through their illness. There's also the Karnofsky scale, the FAST score for Alzheimer's dementia. Um, people with Alzheimer's dementia, it's typically when they are speaking less than six words or unable to hold up their head, they're at a um, FAST score where their um, hospice care would be appropriate. Also following lab values, as I mentioned, serum albumin, anemia, um, you know, are important indicators as well. And hospice, um, Nurses and clinicians, um, providers can help with these, making these decisions if you're not sure if your patient is ready for hospice. We do these visits a lot where we will visit patients in the community um, and, and de determine their eligibility for hospice care. As we're getting towards the end, I want to make sure we have time to talk on this next slide about when to suggest a hospice discussion. So Dr. Carpenter, do you want to share some of these criteria with us? Sure, sure. And I think, you know, these, again, a lot of these are kind of common to us, right? But just thinking about, you know, <clears throat> having a hospice discussion doesn't mean somebody is being admitted to hospice care. And, and if you approach it that way, you know, can we, and I say to families, you know, can we talk a little bit about what kind of care you want going forward because you've had multiple hospital admissions, but yet I keep hearing from you, you don't want to go to the hospital, but the hospital is the only place that makes you feel better. So let's talk about what that means and why, you know, what can we do for you that you may be able to be at home and have your symptoms managed? Well, I sure the patient says, sure, I'd love that. Well, I have a great um, way to do that. And, and it's called hospice. And it doesn't mean 
you know, it doesn't mean necessarily that you're in the last month of life. It, it, it's, it's about, you know, having the best care possible for the next several months of life, right? Um, people who have a terminal illness are they're in the terminal phase of a chronic disease, such as, you know, end stage um, respiratory disease, cardiac disease, and um, people who are no longer responding to the treatments that they were responding to previously. Um, patients who may be refusing treatment and may not want to pursue the treatments that are being uh, suggested for them. And again, when comfort's the primary goal, and, and I think we can all agree, people all want to be comfortable. Um, I think it's it's a little bit tougher to determine, you know, um, how to how to help people make decisions when treatments may be more burdensome than beneficial. That's That seems to be where a, a lot of, of challenges. Yeah. This has all been incredible information. Thank you so much, Dr. Carpenter. If there's one thing that we should take away from this webinar today, what would it be? You know, I would say that to um, not delay a discussion about serious illness. And if you're concerned about using the word hospice, use, you know, just talk about what it is that a person understands about their illness and what it is that they want. In, in the future for their care. Um, I think that's the most important thing is to not delay having a conversation. We've had uh, some continuing education programs on how to have discussions and how to um, use certain communication skills and having these discussions. So I'd highly encourage you to reach out to Coastal Hospice if you're interested in some sort of training, some sort of educational program around having these discussions. There are many, many programs and tools out there that that you know that we use in teaching, but also that you can engage in so that you can have these conversations and, and you don't delay them. Um, I think that's probably the biggest thing and, and also, you know, to, if you think you have a patient who may be eligible for hospice services is just to call hospice and find out more information um, and find out when it would be appropriate and how to move forward through that process so that people get the care that they want um, at the end of life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Carpenter. We're here to support you as physicians and clinicians and community members with these difficult conversations. So again, please utilize us. We're here to help. Dr. Carpenter, you've been wonderful. Thank you so much for having this important conversation with us today. And Lauren, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Jim Carpenter, for this presentation on topic that may be relevant for many. And thank you to everyone who has joined us today. We hope the information was useful to you. We encourage everyone to attend our next in-person program on Tuesday, August 29th at 7 a.m. on a topic, pain management and palliative care. This program will be at the Title Health. Uh, please visit the website soon to register. To wrap things up, we ask that you take a couple of minutes to fill out this short survey. Your feedback will help us bring relevant programs to you, your practice, and those you care for, as well as allowing us to provide the free education credits to you. To complete the survey, you can click on the appropriate link for your field or scan the QR code from the slide on the screen now. You can also visit the chat box where we are displaying the links. Additionally, you will receive a follow-up email following the presentation containing the same links and QR codes to the surveys. You will be able to print your certificate of completion immediately after completing the survey, which in includes the continuing education credits. This was a presentation on a topic um, from the Coastal Caregiver Academy, supporting and empowering caregivers in our community in partnership with Title Health Peninsula Regional. At Coastal Hospice, we are here for you and you can call us at any time, the number on your screen. Thank you once again for joining us. I am Lauren King and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.